These new minis that Crippled God Foundry sent me are so cool that I figured they deserve their own special build. Hey guys, welcome back to Black Magic Craft. This episode is sponsored by Crippled God Foundry. They sent me their new upcoming set of miniatures, which is really, really neat. They took inspiration from a classic Grimm's fairy tale, but put a much darker adult spin on it. I mean, really, Grimm's fairy tales is already pretty dark, but they've taken it a step further. They've released a line of miniatures that could be both great for a unique themed adventure, but also great for player characters. Imagine some dark universe where seven savage, angry dwarves have to defend themselves against a monstrous giant queen. This is no princess. The line is high quality resin. These are nice. The set comes boxed with everything bagged and needing assembly. One bonus is that they each come with a sculpted base already included. There are six standalone dwarfs, each that could represent a different class in D&D. The seventh dwarf is a bit mental. It's a goggle-wearing inventor driving a giant mech of some sort. This thing is crazy. It's big, it's badass, it's awesome. I love that it isn't firmly planted in high fantasy, but mixes elements of modern, futuristic, maybe even steampunk into one crazy character. You also get an angry bear. I'm not sure why, but a bear is very useful. Maybe this is for the druid dwarf's animal form. Last is Marga the Giant Queen. This lady is big and nasty, truly a formidable foe. Again, a really large size mini with fantastic detail. I should mention that Crippled God were smart in sending me a set of fully painted minis to show you guys. So shout out to Raven Wolf Modeling Studio that painted these up in a very short time crunch. What can I say? These are exceptionally high quality boutique minis that would work well in any fantasy based tabletop RPG. If you want to find out more and grab some for yourself, there will be a link in the video description to Crippled God's site. But I don't want this just to be a product video about the minis, so let's build them something cool. I wanted to make them a home that was a little more on the fairy tale style of things, and I did something I normally don't do. I started with a rough sketch of what I was going to build. Because this house was going to have a slightly more complicated form than I usually build, with intersecting roof lines, doing this sketch really helped me get a good mental picture of how it would lay out. I was very tempted to make this out of Styrodur, but opted to instead make it out of Dollar Tree foam core as this is a material much more of my viewers can easily get. I also, again, wanted to prove that you can build stuff like this with very simple material. The first piece I laid out was for the front wall. I wanted it to have kind of a curved arch on the roof and decided to make a template out of construction paper to help make it symmetrical. I find this is the best way to go when doing these sorts of shapes. Next was the back wall. This wall would be where the two different forms of the house connect into one continuous surface. It had to mirror image both of the front walls and join into one. Does that make sense? I'm having a really hard time putting that information into words. After cutting out the walls, I removed the paper and added some texture with aluminum foil. I didn't want to add a texture paste or grout to create the stucco. I really like this simple method. It's insanely fast and in the end is debatably the best looking. I quickly assembled the structure with hot glue. PVA? Ain't nobody got time for that. I did want to make the walls a lot more secure and durable, so using some half inch insulation foam, I cut some pieces to fit inside. I did use PVA glue for these as sliding them in and using hot glue would be too messy. Because the walls had a bit of bow to them, I pinned them in place for a bit while the glue tacked up. 
I knew whatever material I used for the roof would need a ridge beam to attach to, so I cut a rectangle length of XPS foam and glued it in place. I freehand cut the shape to follow the invisible slope of the roof. This didn't have to be perfect, but I did have to be careful to get it as close to perfect as possible so it didn't distort the roof line later, or end up too low and useless for gluing. With this in place, I was able to start closing in the roof. I knew this would be a bit tricky to get right, so again, I turned to construction paper to figure out the size and shape first, as it's easier to bend. Normally, I'd use chipboard for the substrate of a roof, but with the curve, I figured foam core would bend a bit better. This has the added advantage of giving me a bit of thickness that I could later draw wood grain on to look like some soffit and fascia without adding any extra pieces. To make it bend to the shape I needed, I implemented a trick Gerard Boone taught me of rubbing the foam on the hard edge of a desk to compress the bottom and create a curve. I haven't quite mastered this yet and sort of cracked the foam, but it wouldn't matter much as I'd be covering it up with other material later. Then it was a simple matter of gluing the roof in place. The second roof was the more difficult one. It also would need a ridge beam for support, but this time I decided to make an interior wall that was cut to fit the shape of the other roof. This took me two tries to get right, but the second one fit nicely and would provide a lot of stability. I just had to slightly bevel the top of the piece so it didn't protrude past the roof line. Yet again, I turned to construction paper to figure out the size and shape of the foam I needed. I wanted to fill in the little area in front with a sort of deck. So using a piece of scrap foam, I carved in some wood planks and textured them with a wire brush to add wood grain. I glued that in place right to the structure. This again would provide more stability to the overall piece. This would later get ripped off. I started to carve all the exposed foam that would be wood in the final product. Using a fresh X-Acto, I went around and beveled the edges in a wavy manner. This gives the foam a nice look of hand-hewn timber. I also added the wood grain with a pencil now before I added any other layers as it would only get harder to do as the piece progressed. Then I started to think about windows and the door. Digging through my bits from shiftinglands.com, I came across this one door that really stood out. My original vision of this house was more of a nice little cottage with flowers in the window. But seeing this iron door really made me pivot. I realized it fit nicely with the crazy mech dwarf. I started to think about the kind of cottage dwarves would live in. Angry, weird dwarves, especially ones that built giant mechs. From this point, my vision moved to a more industrial looking cottage. I wanted to go for a weird mix of happy cottage and crazy metal weirdness. But before I could get into some of those cool metal details, I had to go through the tedious task of adding the wattle and daub timbers. I used XPS foam to cut a bunch of strips, and I did use Styrodur here because there was a piece sitting right by my hot wire cutter that was the perfect size to work with, but this absolutely could be done with any insulation, foam, or even foam core. I find that the way to get the best look is to bevel the edges randomly and then to do the pencil wood grain, all before attaching to the piece. This is pretty tedious and I tend to get bored halfway through, but it's worth the effort for sure as it's one of the defining features on a build like this. Doing the boards around things like curved doors is a little bit tricky, but foam is pretty bendable as long as you don't bend it too far. A few pins to hold it in place as the glue dries helps considerably. For some reason, I decided that one side of the building should be more like a log cabin. I don't know why it meant having to make more planks, but I guess I'm just a glutton for punishment. And I didn't like how the deck I made using the wire brush technique looked so different than the timber I did with a pencil. I like both styles, but they are distinctly different and the mixture just didn't seem right. So I ripped it off and remade it using the same foam and pencil method as the planks. Now using the pencil sculpting method, I decorated the foam core even more. I drew in a fieldstone foundation and some cracks in the stucco. I even used the layering method to recess one area and draw in some timbers. This would give the impression that the whole build was built like log cabin style, but that part of it was later covered over with stucco. As you can see, this can be achieved even with the simple Dollar Tree foam core. A round window by the door seemed to fit the look I was going for, so I found one. 
cut out the foam and glued it in place. I'm not sure why I decided to glue the windows in place. This would make adding the glass later a lot harder and much crappier looking. In the past, I've cut out the foam and left the window frames out until the end. I should have done that here, but I seem to do some things differently every time for some reason even when I know a better method. For the finishing surface on the roof, since I was going for a more weird industrial look, I opted to use corrugated paper. I have this on hand for my more post-apocalyptic builds. This stuff is the fastest way to simulate corrugated metal you will ever find, and I absolutely love it. My first attempt didn't quite get the cutout right, so I used my mistake piece to create a better one. The second one, luckily, fit like a charm. I still had the templates I made earlier for the foam, so I could again use them to cut out the pieces for the other roof. You'll notice that I ran the ridges of the corrugation in different directions on each roof. There wasn't a specific reason for this, other than the fact I couldn't decide which way they should go and said, screw it, why not both? Here I made a small mistake that will be more evident after paint. I kinked one of the pieces causing an ugly line across the ridges. I don't know why I didn't redo this piece, but I didn't and I would pay for it later. To hide the seam and cap the roofs, I used a small strip of construction paper. Easy peasy. This is where I got after a full day of working on it. I finished the night applying my coat of Mod Podge, and it's always a win when you can get a piece to this stage to dry overnight after the first day and be ready for painting on day two. The next day though, I realized that this thing was missing something, so I made some foam timbers to add a little bit more detail to the roof line. I also thought it would be awesome to add something ornate to the ridge line. My collection of MDF bits from Shifting Lands has some really beautiful fence pieces. I realized if I cut them down, they would make for great metal spikes. This was a bit time consuming to snip them, sand them, and attach them, but completely worth it. The pieces unfortunately were not long enough to run the whole length, so I had to carefully cut and seam them. But again, I think this was really worth the effort. After opening this can of worms, I kept going, using the cutoff leftovers to add nice decorative elements to the front wall, as well as a little doorknob keyhole piece. I hit the piece with some black spray primer, as brushing onto the MDF would be way too annoying. Also, coating the whole piece gave me a flatter surface to paint on. A word about spray paint and foam. Yes, spray paint can melt foam, but if you learn how to apply it properly, and test different brands, you can do it safely. This brand, using correct spraying techniques, lets me spray paint even on raw foam. In this case, the layer of Mod Podge adds more protection, but I have confidently done it on raw foam because of my tests and practicing. Seriously, practice spray painting raw foam until you figure it out. Get a few different brands, test it, Test out your techniques, learn the safe distance, and get it right so you're not so afraid of spray paint and so that you don't accidentally melt your piece out of negligence. You can do it. It just takes practice, consideration, and testing a few different products. Stop being so afraid of spray paint. It's okay. You just gotta practice. Now the actual painting could start. As usual, I did the wood in a new way. I tried using a very beigey, almost pink hued brown as the undercoat to all the wood. At first, I was just going to paint the wood, but I figured I might as well use the same color to base coat the stucco. I wanted to paint the roof and decorative metal bits using a metallic bronze, so I base coated them in an orangey brown that was very close to the metallic color. This one didn't cover too well and needed two coats. I also hit the stone foundation with a medium gray. Next was the actual metallic bronze on all the metal areas. At this point, I decided to do the wash before dry brushing or doing the lighter stucco color. I hit everything with my homemade black wash. I also used a little bit of my homemade patina on the roof, but I didn't want to overdo this and went very light. To a point, it's probably not even noticeable on the final project. This is where the crack in that one piece of corrugated paper really started to bug me. I had to cover it. I decided to cut some strips of paper to act like banding on the roof. 
This would hide that flaw and add one more bit of visual interest. The super glue I used to attach and cover the strips gave them a nice metallic texture. I opted to paint these out in a gunmetal gray to add some contrast. Now the nice thing is that I used brown paper. So after applying the gunmetal, I used a wet cotton swab to remove some of that paint. The brown paper underneath was already the perfect rust color to peek through. At this point, I used a gray to dry brush the wood. This usually gives a nice aged look, but because of my color choice for the base coat, it looked a bit strange and I'd have to improve this later. On the stucco, I used a cream or kind of off-white color. Instead of painting it out wet and fully covering, which would need another wash to bring back the details, I decided to dry brush it. This would take several coats to actually get the opacity needed to look white, and it was a bit annoying to dry brush little areas like the corners of the gable ends, but I'm really happy with the way it turned out in the end, and I might default to this method moving forward if I remember it. Like I said, it's like every paint job is the first paint job for me for some reason. Now to fix that janky ass wood. A quick sepia wash toned down the gray and really gave it a much richer look. I gave the stones a light wash as well, mixing some black nolan oil, sepia, and a bit of green for some subtle variation. Then using that same green wash, I went in and did some small mildew stains on all of the seams and corners. I have a tendency to overdo these effects, so I was careful not to go overboard. Although some people would probably say that I still put on too much. Now for the windows. If I had kept them separate, I could have done these much nicer and much easier, but I didn't. I used some UV resin to create the glass. Because I didn't want any of the foam behind showing through, I had to mix in a tiny bit of black ink. I wanted it to look like the lights were out inside. This worked out okay, but trying to do this in place is so much harder than when they are loose. And because I couldn't pour directly from the dropper bottle, I had to pour from the mixing cup, which was incredibly awkward awkward and messy. I ended up with some unsightly bubbles, but you know what? It's fine. It's important to keep things in perspective and remember that things like this will be used on a table amongst other items and viewed from a few feet away. Nobody is going to care. It's going to look fine. One more little detail. A nice little decorative railing for the porch, using the shifting land fences. Of course, on the last piece of this build, I just had to run out of super glue. None left in the whole shop. I had to opt for PVA, which is far more annoying for this sort of joint, but you gotta do what you gotta do. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Oh my God, oh my God, this house has no chimney. How did he build a house without a chimney? Quick, I gotta go to the comments and let him know that his house has no chimney. Just for you guys, I gave this house two chimneys. Using some straws, I made two very easy steel chimneys. I glued a strip of paper to band them together and keep them straight. And I really like this added element. I'm pretty proud of this project. It's really different than anything else I've ever built. And I think it was a pretty successful way to take inspiration from the models I was given. And I think they fit together pretty wonderfully. Again, I want to thank Crippled God for sponsoring this video and inspiring this project. I think you guys should check out their products if you're into high quality resin miniatures. This line itself is amazing, but they actually have a whole lot of really great miniatures in their store. They do exceptionally high quality work and they are a small independent company in this community and I'd love to see them grow and grow. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, hit the like button and let me know in the comments section. If you want to pick up any tools or supplies for your hobby journey, head over to blackmagiccraft.ca. There I put in a lot of time to list, explain, and link to the vast majority and tools and supplies that I use in my builds to kind of help you figure out what you need. And lastly, if you really enjoy these videos I make, consider helping me keep making them by supporting the channel on Patreon. Patreon is always needed and greatly appreciated. But at this current time on YouTube, hobbyists are in a very turbulent and dangerous situation with upcoming changes to the way YouTube and the laws function. I don't even want to talk about it too much, but it's a bit of an intimidating and scary thing. And we're not sure how it's going to play out. So Patreon will be absolutely crucial in the new year if things go sour. So consider helping out if you really 
care about the channel. Hopefully it won't matter. Hopefully it'll be okay. Anyways, that's it for this week, guys. I hope you have a great weekend. I hope you build something cool inspired with us. I'll see you again next week. Cheers.